Our scripture reading this morning comes from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 23 through 25, and I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. Let's hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, because the one who made the promises is reliable. Let's also think about how to motivate each other to show love and to do good works. Don't stop meeting together with other believers, which some people have gotten into the habit of doing. Instead, encourage each other, especially as you see the day drawing near. Here ends the reading, Spirit of God, stir up your people. I have to confess to you that I don't spend a lot of time in Hebrews. It's a pretty technical letter, and I've never led a study on it, but I was struck with how great these verses are for today. They're just a piece of the lectionary, and I was struck with the reminder, especially found at the end of the reading. Instead, encourage each other, especially as you see the day drawing near. It's a reminder that Advent isn't just about celebrating and remembering the time God was made incarnate in Jesus, come to earth as a baby in a manger in swaddling clothes with all those wonderful things that we love to read about and to sing about. But Advent is also about the reminder that we are longing for that day and working for that day when Jesus will come again and recreate heaven and earth. It reminds us that our lives and our work and our holiness is on a trajectory greater than our own selves. Now, before we really get into talking about love, we have to get a little nerdy. And before we can get a little nerdy, we have to go back and read just a little more scripture. There's a chunk in my Bible, we'll call it a pericope in fancy words, with a little title above it by some editor that called this the second summary of the message. That's what it says in your pew Bibles on page 918. And it starts in verse 19. So I'm going to go back and read the whole thing again. I'm going to start in verse 19 and finish at verse 25. Brothers and sisters, we have confidence that we can enter the Holy of Holies by means of Jesus' blood through a new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, which is his body. And we have a great high priest over God's house. Therefore, let's draw near with a genuine heart, with the certainty that our faith gives us, since our hearts are sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies are washed with pure water. Let's hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, because the one who made the promises is reliable. Let's also think about how to motivate each other to show love and to do good works. Don't stop meeting together with other believers, which some people have gotten into the habit of doing. Instead, encourage each other, especially as you see the day drawing near. Now, we have to get a little bit nerdy and talk about what Jesus actually does on the cross, what Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension do for the work because the author of Hebrews says that we have to know this before we can get to the part about motivating each other to love. Now, I have to give a shout out to one of my friends, Reverend Travis Stevick, for introducing this theology to us at Summer Games University. So if you went to SGU this year, you have heard this teaching before or a version of this teaching before and he based his teaching off the work of David Moffat. David Moffat's theory is that the author of Hebrews uses the temple sacrifices of the Old Testament as an archetype for understanding what Jesus does on the cross. If you look at the instructions found in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Exodus, you learn that Jesus in Hebrews, or Jesus on the death of the cross and the resurrection and the ascension, serves not only as the sacrifice, but also serves as the high priest. Now, this is all language that we're used to saying in the church, but what exactly does it mean? But we have to go back to the Old Testament to realize what's happening. Jesus dies outside on a hill, outside of Jerusalem, outside of the temple. This is the same type of place that sacrifices would have actually been killed. They're killed outside of the temple. And then the priest carries the blood into the temple to actually enact the worship. 
Jesus dies here on earth, and he's resurrected with a physical body. That is his role as sacrifice and the beginning of his role as priest because his physical body continues to carry his blood. And then it is the ascension into the heavenly temple with his physical body, with his blood in him, that is his role as priest. He has brought the blood of the sacrifice into the presence of God. And now he serves in the high priest function. The high priest's function was to go to the Holy of Holies once a year, carrying the prayers of the people in order to be reconciled in relationship with God. And what Hebrews tells us is that Jesus has done this for us in a heavenly temple permanently. We have to understand this because it sets us up for the next part. See, if you read the Old Testament, you realize that there was kind of a pattern, that the people built layers and layers between them and God. So by the time Jesus comes around, if you were to come to temple worship, there would be the Holy of Holies, and then there would be the court of the Jews, and then the court of the Gentiles, and it just moves out and out and out from where they considered the presence of God. And where the presence of God was, the high priest could go in there one day a year after doing other sacrifices and after taking special baths, and he would have to wear a robe with bells on it so they could tell if he died in the Holy of Holies because the presence of God was so overwhelming, right? Can you imagine that worship? And it all begins back when you have to go all the way back to Exodus. I told you we were getting nerdy, but stick with me here. It's so important. You go all the way back to Exodus, and there's this moment where God invites the people to fast for three days and to prepare themselves for three days and then to come to God on the holy mountain where God appears in smoke and fire and thunder. And the people, given the opportunity to draw near, say, no, thank you. The presence of God is too overwhelming for us. It's too scary. It's too intimidating. And so then Moses goes up the mountain, and Joshua goes up the mountain, and we start with this priestly function of anointing and sprinkling. And what Jesus does is Jesus removes all of those barriers. Jesus opens the holy of holies and invites all people into the presence of God by standing in God's presence with his blood. That's what's happening here. And we remember this and need to know this before we get to the therefores. The first therefore. Therefore, let's draw near with a genuine heart, with the certainty that our faith gives us since our hearts are sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies are washed with pure water. Notice what the author does not say. That we can come into the presence of God if X, Y, and Z. If you have all your stuff together. You can come to the Christmas Eve service if you have wrapped all your presents. Right? You can come to church if you are dressed properly. Or if you're feeling right. Or if you're feeling good with God. It doesn't say that. What it says is that we draw near to God because of what Jesus has done. And nothing we can do can change that. It's Jesus' work that sprinkles us clean. It's Jesus' work that washes us with pure water. And that truth remains the same. And then it goes on. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, because the one who made the promises is reliable. This will not change. We will always be able to be in the presence of God because of Jesus' work that continues to this day. Jesus is still serving as a high priest for each of us. And then finally, let us also think about how to motivate each other to show love and to do good works. Don't stop meeting together with other believers, which some people have gotten into the habit of doing, Instead, encourage each other, especially as you see the day drawing near. We have to pause here and name a reality that I don't think we name enough in the church. 
We understand that love is a verb. I hope you all understand that. Love is a verb. That giddy feeling when we first fall in love with somebody, that butterfly feeling, that I can't sleep because I am so happy feeling, we all know that that goes away eventually, right? Or it ebbs and it flows. Sometimes it comes back and we feel those feelings again. But it's not a constant everyday thing. So when we say we love somebody, we must mean something more than that giddy feeling, right? Even that oh, I just had a kid glow, goes away after a bit. Love is a verb, and that means love is exhausting. It is exhausting to wake up in the middle of the night because the toddler has a tummy ache, but we do it anyway. It is work. It is exhausting. Just, it's okay. You don't have to confess to anything. Keep it all in your head. I don't want you getting in trouble with anybody. But imagine all the times you've watched a movie or gone to an activity or talked about a book that you had no interest in, but you did it because you cared about the person you were talking to. It's exhausting. It's hard work. My son is officially in love with basketball. I hate basketball. Guess what I don't hate anymore because I love my son, right? I'm going to watch basketball for my kid. It's exhausting to do this work. And that's not even beginning to talk about the type of love that God actually calls us to engage in. We're just talking about how exhausting it is to love the people we like. Now imagine All this stuff that God calls us to do, to feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, to welcome the stranger, to visit those in the hospital or visit those in prison, right? To give love to people, to love our enemies. That's what God calls us to do. It is hard work to love somebody that we think might be taking advantage of us. It is hard work to go visit and be compassionate with those people that somewhere in the back of our mind we're like, I think you deserve to be in prison. It is hard work to be attentive to to welcome the stranger when really we're an introvert, right? Love is exhausting. We have to name it out loud because it gets us to the next part. We cannot quit gathering together because it's the gathering together that keeps provoking us to love. Now, I can tell you, when it comes to conversations about church attendance, the argument I always get back is, well, I can worship God anywhere. I can worship God on the golf course. I meet God on the golf course all the time. I meet God at the fishing hole. I meet God watching a football game. You know, I meet God doing my favorite arts and crafts. And my response to that is, yes, I hope it's true. Absolutely, we should be worshiping and praying to God at all times and in all places. I will not fight with you on that. Hebrews tells us that the reason we gather is because love is exhausting. And when we gather, we remind ourselves of the truths and we remind each other of the truth that we are loved by God, that God has already made a way for us. And if you're tired of showing love to the world, let us help you be provoked to keep going, to keep demonstrating that love. That is why we gather together in worship, and not only to keep going tomorrow, but to keep going until that day when Jesus shall come again and recreate heaven and earth.